Well, Gugu, it's an interesting time. It really is an interesting time to be African because for so many years the commodity prices led led us to led, led us to only one direction, which basically was to export mm. because the price was so high. Right now, with prices coming down for the first time in a long time, African governments are actually listening. You can sit down, talk to them, and they would listen. They will listen to solutions that are now driving the African entrepreneur to bring in internal solutions. And we've lived the problems. <clears throat> no one has lived these problems more than the African entrepreneur working in Africa over the last 20 years as we have. And so we have solutions. And for the first time, we can sit across the table and prefer solutions. What are these solutions and is there a perfect balance given the fact that we naturally blessed with natural resources but commodity prices aren't assisting with the situation? Is clean energy a potential solution for the continent? Yeah, it's a potential solution for the con continent. But some of the things that you're finding, for example, is where you have African innovators who are sitting down and looking for solutions at the very basic level. And an example I would give you with Enactus, Enactus is a program with university students which Sahara supports, and we created a power solution a power competition for students to come up with solutions that are very basic. And this, this group in the Kaduna Polytechnic up in the north came out with a solution whereby they can generate power just using water, 50, 50 kg of water, with a dynamo system that continues to run around and it produces 4,000 uh, kilowatts of power, enough to power a small hospital, a small clinic, enough to power a, a community hall, enough to power a poultry farm. And we took this to South Africa in a competition where they won in Nigeria. They didn't come first in, in South Africa in the global challenge, but those are the kind of innovative ideas that can come out when you begin to look inwards. If we do take a look at uh, recent reports regarding fuel shortages in Nigeria, just how far have we come in dealing with that particular crisis? And are uh, your uh, uh, colleagues as well as uh, family members on this ground in River State, Nigeria, uh, feeling the impacts of this? Well, we were up, 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 to, up until uh, early this year. And one of the things that the benefit of low oil prices has brought is that it's taking subsidy out. It's something that we have been advocating for the last, I don't know how many years, mm -hmm. that if you don't, as major, people believe that because because we're major importers and because we're major bulk suppliers of petroleum products into the Nigerian market, that subsidy is something that we enjoy. And it's not. It's something we actually despise because it takes too much time to get paid. You put up your capital first in, in it. You don't get enough. By the time you're paid, your capital is useless. Everything is gone. So it never benefits us. And what we've been advocating for a long time is that deregulation should come into the market. The subsidy should go so that we can compete fairly. And at the end of the day, it may seem that prices may go up uh, at the initial stage. But at the end of the day, with good competition, the consumers will benefit. Anyway, low oil prices has forced that to happen. Mm. And so at the beginning of this year, the subsidy was taken away. And now we just have to see how we're going to work over the next couple of days. Something that also came through from an earlier panel this morning was naturally the focus on power and energy and the recent announcement of a collaborative effort from a continental perspective when it comes to clean energy and power. Uh, your thoughts on how this will impact the Sahara Group and uh, African economies overall? Okay, so first of all, in, from the Nigerian context, uh, Sahara has invested heavily in power. Today we're the largest Afri producer of power in Nigeria generating and the largest distributor also in Nigeria. But we also have a global uh, footprint. Let's a continental footprint whereby we want to expand this across Africa and for a long time we haven't been able to match policy with in, uh, investment coming in and a market going out. The market existed, the money existed, but policy just did not bring that together. And what you're seeing with the Power Africa initiative right now is that you have governments, you have policymakers, you have investors like ourselves, and you have a whole continent that is waiting for, for these products. So for the first time again, maybe because of low oil prices, again you find people being able to sit down across the table and everyone is doing the talking at the same time. Mm. And this is what the Vice President brought in when he came in to uh, uh, when he came into power. One of the things that happened was as soon as they came in, we went to him and we said, no one is talking to us. No one has asked us who are the investors in this business who know exactly where it's hurting, how we can solve the problem. And if you can, if someone can just listen and hear what we have to say, I can guarantee you that we can bring power onto into the grid very quickly. And he said, really? 
And he called, he listened, mm. he heard what we had to say, and then he called everybody onto the table. And the one thing that we said is that you must bring everybody to the table. The regulators, ourselves, the market operator, everyone should just sit at the table. And for one minute, no one should talk. Everyone should just take a deep breath and listen to each other and find out where we can make a difference. Mm. To close off with, uh, the theme for the forum this year is the fourth industrial revolution in the context of entrepreneurship development as well as uh, ensuring that we uh, provide the necessary skills and in the education uh, to the youth in uh, the Africa. Are we doing enough and what needs to change? Hmm. Are we doing enough? Well, so first of all, Africa talks about leapfrogging. And whenever you talk about technology, the first thing they will tell you about is the mobile technology and how it helped Africa leapfrog. So we agree that there's a leapfrogging uh, opportunity that the fourth industrial revolution brings. But you have to remember it in the context of Africa. So the first thing that Africans are concerned about today is how do I get food on the table? Okay, so that's the first thing. And if the fourth industrial revolution does not begin to address the issues for Africans about how they will get food on the table, then we have, we have a problem from the start. So you must be able to use technology in agriculture, you have to use technology in education, you have to use technology in skill set, and if you can do all of that, then it will create the jobs that, that matter. And what do you find across board with Africans? For years we've been traders. We trade, we trade all sorts of trades. We sell, we hawk, we do anything. And so trading is a way that skill sets have been built. Now, you can call trading entrepreneurship, okay, so you can define entrepreneurship as you want, but you can call it that the African naturally is somebody who wants to buy and sell. Now, can you create value from what they buy and sell? Can you use technology to then create that value and help them become greater entrepreneurs? Absolutely. And what do you need to do? Celebrate the small-scale entrepreneur, celebrate the big ones. Celebrate those who are making a difference, those who have grown to be the Saharas of, of the world today. Celebrate them. Celebrate those who are coming out with new technological uh, advances. Celebrate them. If you can put all of that and put it out through technology for other Africans to see, wow.